Hi everyone, this is the G2's professional spotlight series, wherein we cover professional journeys of global marketing leaders and take their insights on key industry trends. My name is Siddharth Yadav and I'm a senior editorial content specialist at G2. And joining us today is Leandro Perez, who is a senior vice president and chief marketing officer for Salesforce in the Asia Pacific region. He comes with an experience of more than 20 years spanning different industries and regions. Today, he leads marketing efforts for the CRM firm in more than 10 countries. He's combined his technical business leadership skills to create marketing strategies. Welcome, Leandro. Thanks for joining us today for this chat. Thank you. No, thank you for the opportunity. I'm excited to have the chat. Absolutely. I'm hoping for a riveting conversation and hope our audience has a lot of takeaways from this conversation. So before we deep dive into marketing questions and, you know, dissecting key technological trends, including AI, we'd like to know more about you as an individual. So all of us have a special favorite beverage. So what's your favorite beverage and when do you enjoy it the most? Look, I've probably got two. One is I, I do a protein shake every morning. I try to, you know, do a little workout and I follow it up with a little protein to ensure that I can <laughs> recover the muscles. But I also do love my little morning macchiato that I have when I arrive into the office. That's great. Uh, what was your first job that got you started as a professional? And uh, when you were starting that job, did you have this reckoning that you would reach where you are currently? Look, my first job, and this is going way back before I even finished school, I actually started working when I was 14 at an electronics store. The Australians may remember is a store called Dick Smith Electronics. But for those that don't know, it's, a, it's, it's a, like a chain of electronics stores. And uh, I used to go and work on the weekends there. And I, I got to learn a lot about customer experience and how to work in a team and how to follow a manager's instructions and personal discipline showing up on time. And also, I learned a lot about sales and, uh, and marketing there as well, actually. But my first uh, actual professional job coming out of university, I had just finished my computer science degree. I was actually a programmer, and uh, I definitely did not think that I would be where I am today when I started that role. Right. So certainly, you had a lot of initial learnings that you carried along and that still inform your practices as a marketer. Uh, what's currently your favorite software on the uh, tech stack, of course, uh, the first one I'm assuming is going to be Salesforce, but do you have any other uh, things on the tech stacks that really excite you? Well, look, of course, I'm biased working at Salesforce, but I'll say, and, and we did acquire this product as well, but my favorite tool is Slack. Uh, Slack allows me in my role that you mentioned where I'm dealing not only with over 10 countries in Asia Pacific, but dealing with folks all around the world, allows me to work in an asynchronous fashion. So... I can send a voice clip or a video recording of myself to someone. Then while I'm sleeping, they're responding and I can be having a conversation that avoids a meeting. There's a lot of new AI capabilities there. So Slack is my absolute favorite tool at the moment. And I know I'm biased, but I'd probably say that even if I didn't work at Salesforce. Thank you. Uh, there are these moments at office when we are frustrated and they just want to make us throw our laptops out of the window. Uh, <laughs> What problems at your work would want you to do that? Well, look, luckily I haven't, I haven't done that yet. <laughs> uh, but look, I understand the, the point of the question. Look, in, uh, in marketing, many of us have to have strong stakeholder relationships with sales. And uh, my relationship with sales, I, I take very seriously. Um, but historically, like many folks, m attribution within marketing is something that can get a little bit contentious, right? So... Where did the lead originate from or what pipeline was generated? And was that sales? Was that marketing? Was something else? And when I started in this role, I've been at Salesforce for almost 10 years, but when I started in this role in 2020, that was a big contentious item. item. And I'm happy to say that our global CMO, uh, when he came in, he actually wanted to relook at the way that we were doing our marketing attribution and implemented some new uh, algorithms that using AI to calculate the percentage of attribution to pipe between sales and marketing. And uh, those moments have actually reduced since that's uh, been implemented. But, um, you know, it's something that you've always got to keep an eye on that relation between sales and marketing. Thank you. That's an interesting insight that AI is helping resolve that classic tussle or that classic point of friction between sales and marketing with respect to 
attribution. So very interesting to know that. Now that we know a bit about you on a personal level, I'm sure it will be a riveting conversation for our audience. We've got a series of interesting uh, questions planned for this conversation. Let's start with your professional journey first. You started as an engineer, then transitioned into a marketing role. Uh, could you take us through your professional journey and you know, also sort of talk about significant milestones and how they shaped you as a marketer? Yeah, look, I'll give the shorter version as we could spend uh, over an hour just talking about the journey. But uh, like you mentioned before, it's where I started is not where I am now. And I definitely didn't think I would be in marketing, uh, even if you asked me you know, 10, 15 years ago when I first started some of my roles there. Um, I'd say my, my first roles in engineering, what that taught me was really understand how technology can address a business problem. And, you know, I was trying as myself, as a coder, as an engineer to solve a problem that I was um, being given. But then ultimately all these things that I was fixing was to meet a business need. So from an early sort of uh, start to my career, I realized that technology can help not just for the sake of more technology, but to solve a business need. And in that company, it was actually a, a small company where every enhancement that I did to the software was a direct request from the business to make a change in the platform. So it was very closely aligned. In fact, they were paying only when that enhancement got delivered. Um, you know, fast forward some other pivotal moments. My next role was in uh, what some might call solution engineering or pre-sales. It was Again, something I didn't know I'd be doing, but uh, I was approached to say, well, look, you know technology very well. Um, I had been an engineer now for, for about five years and people were saying, well, you know, if you want to spend more time with the customer, you probably need to, uh, you know, look at other roles. And I, and I didn't know what that would be. When, and so when this came across to me, it was use my technology skill, but meeting with customers to work out what their problems were. Because sometimes business owners understand that there's a challenge, but don't know there's a better way. So what my role as a solution engineer was to go and showcase, and at the time I was working with some enterprise search technology to showcase how that could help solve the discoverability challenge that was at the time um, very common around the early 2000s. Um, fast forward, I did a few pre-sales roles and where I actually ended up landing was my first product marketing role, which actually is what took me to the US. And uh, the reason I was able to do that was I got to know some of the products really well that I was positioning to our customers. In fact, so well that uh, I was approached to say, well, you know the product so well. Product marketing is about understanding what the product does and the pain points of a customer and creating the messaging, the assets, the way that you sell to, um, to a customer, talking to analysts. And so that took me over to the US. I joined a company um, uh, called Tipco. We was doing integration software, middleware software. And uh, that was really eye-opening for me because product marketing was a whole new world, right? So product marketing allowed me to be at the forefront of technology, but also realize that the way that you sell technology is is just as important to the way that you position. Um, and, and so not just what it can do, but what people think it can do and credibility with customer case studies and all those things. Um, so, you know, product marketing was really, really interesting. And I did that for several years, which is eventually how I got into Salesforce. I helped launch Analytics Cloud at the time. It's obviously been rebranded now as Einstein Analytics um, at Salesforce. And um, what uh, when I realized when I got to Salesforce is that it um, was all moving to the cloud. You know, obviously Salesforce was the pioneer in that space. And um, where I started to get interested was, well, I'm in responsible for one product here in product marketing, but we were starting to have many products at Salesforce, a whole platform of products. And so I actually got approached um, to join uh, the corporate messaging team. And eventually I led that team, which was to decide and determine how we represented Salesforce as a collective. So not just one product, but everything that Salesforce does. And I had the privilege of being able to work with our, um, you know, our co-founder and CEO and our leadership team to develop those messages, uh, to own the, uh, the, the, the keynote that we call Dreamforce. Uh, Dreamforce is our largest event for the folks potentially may or may not heard of it. We have about 160,000 people once a year come to San Francisco for a, a whole tech extravaganza. And I was responsible for running the team that would build that keynote. And then we would take that keynote around the world um, on world tours so that all those messages could reach the market. Um, and then I'll finish this very long answer in the, 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 the next step for me was I had sort of gone from everything from engineer to pre-sales to product marketing to running corporate messaging. And kind of what was left for me now was 
well, how do you stitch it all together as a CMO? And this opportunity came up to roll um, this role in the region here, which was coming back to my homeland of Australia and uh, being able to look out for everything from brand to demand and working with local sales leadership to uh, address a whole market. So that's where I am today. Um, I'm sure there's many questions and I, and I skipped over a bunch there, but that's the main trajectory that I've followed. Right. So I see that uh, you've had a very diverse experience in different industry, different regions, but the common thread that runs through all of them is how to leverage technology and integrate it with your role to solve business problems. And I'm sure this technological leaning or this uh, proclivity to technological innovation is something that gives you an edge in your marketing role as well. Uh, I'm sure you have led many transformational marketing projects across the world. Uh, but could you recall one most significant transformational marketing project that you led and what were your key learnings from it? Yeah, look, there's been many. And when you, uh, you, know, you shared your questions, I, I thought about this one. And I think one that's memorable, and it is fairly recent, is that, of course, we're going to be talking a lot about AI, and we've all been talking a lot about AI. But a challenge that we had is that uh, we've been doing AI for some time at Salesforce, in fact, over 10 years when we first introduced our first uh, predictive AI use cases with our um, capability called Einstein. But in the past 12, 15 months, obviously, what exploded was generative AI. And I had the challenge of working out how I can ensure that the local market knows that Salesforce is a player in this space and to get the conversation going, because what was also happening was that many people were defaulting to uh, public available uh, generative AI solutions, which are not safe or trusted, right? Because they're just open to the, you know, to the web, right? Um, and so we launched a campaign globally, which was called Ask More of AI. Uh, and what I wanted to do locally was, yes, of course, we're going to do billboards, we're going to do TV, we're going to do radio. But how do I get the conversation going uh, in each of my markets? And in particular, in this case, I was looking for Australia and Sydney, which is our biggest market uh, in Australia. And so what we did is we set up a temporary, for a few days, uh, wild saloon. Uh, and so it was like, think about your favorite cowboy movie where, you know, someone is out in the wild, wild west and they're going into a bar. We actually recreated a fake bar in the middle of Darling Harbor here in Sydney and uh, anyone could stop by. But what we did, the twist was, is the whole bar had been generated by AI. AI. So from the outside, it looked like a bar, but there was some misspelling in like the title and then like the door, one of them was not the right kind of door. And you walked in and there was a barman with three arms and the drinks were all uh, recipes designed by AI, but they were all slightly off. And so what we were trying to show is that in these early stages of AI, you've got to ask more questions, right? Because AI is still in its infancy. It's still learning. And you can't yet trust it completely if you haven't taken the right steps. And the right steps include ensuring that the data that you share with it is being not leaked to the internet, um, and also that you're able to understand where it got its data from and, and what it's leveraging. So overall, huge success. We had thousands of people go through. We had media coverage. We had a conversation going. Our customers went there. And even for our internal audience of salespeople to understand that this was a shift, a moment in time. And I've been uh, dating myself now, but it's been around for a few tech shifts. And I realized that this is a new one that you need to lean in quickly so that people can understand the real implications, but also the opportunity for it. So that's just one of the many that came to mind when, uh, when, you, when you asked me this one. Thank you, Leandro, for sharing that transformational story. Uh, since you operate in the Asia Pacific market, which is a very diverse market, there are diverse customer preferences, there are unique behaviors. So how do you create synergy among your teams across this region and tailor your strategies uh, to suit and you know to, to be sensitive to these cultural uniqueness across the region? Yeah, so we have uh, what's called operating units at Salesforce. So while my role is APAC, APAC is actually divided into Australia, New Zealand, Southeast Asia, India, and greater China. And so within that, I have in independent teams that are responsible for all those operating units, but I also have 
a thin layer of APAC um, functions so that, to your point on synergy, I don't want to be creating the same asset in India as I am in Australia from scratch. What I want to do is create it once and then maybe localize that last 10 to 15% with the local customer story or local nuance. Um, so I think with that model, I, I give full empowerment. So my leader in India, for example, is fully empowered to run that team, how they see fit. They're very connected because they're in day in, day out with our customers and with our sales teams and the ecosystem. Um, but of course, that then connects into my leadership level, which also includes some pan APAC roles. Um, like we have a pan APAC content role or a pan pan APAC field operations role. And uh, that ensures that I get the best of both worlds. And then, of course, we're all connected to our central sort of headquarters that is obviously creating and disseminating brand guidelines and sort of pieces of content for by, by product and industry as well. So I think I've got a pretty good balance. Um, no model is perfect, but I feel it is one of the better models in that, you know, the local empowerment, getting closer to your customer is what's given us an advantage to ensure that we are respective of all cultures um, and a big thing we have at Salesforce is that our team should represent the communities we serve. So, you know, the team in India is based in India and they're made up of folks from India and the folks in Southeast Asia and Singapore are from that, um, you know, locale as well. And I think that, uh, that makes for a great marketing team. I'm sure a lot of marketing leaders will have key takeaways take from what you just mentioned about localizing your marketing efforts, hiring locally, and also personalizing experiences for uh, customers worldwide in different regions. Leandro, you've also spoken about the emerging role of the CMO as the driver of the customer's single source of truths. If you could help our audience understand what this means for a marketer and what are the concerns relating to an approach like this and how do you resolve them? Well, look, I'm a big advocate. And look, because I've been able to work in different roles and seen different departments, I, uh, I feel very lucky and I feel we're all very privileged if you're able to lead a marketing role because I do think we are growth um, drivers. Uh, we're also creative, uh, but we're also, in my opinion, the closest to the customer, right? We're putting campaigns into market every single day where we get real-time signals about that piece of content is being looked at, this comment is being made. Um, you know, this uh, survey was made and this is the feedback we've received back. So I feel like we've got that pulse on the customer. Um, I guess the change I see is that historically marketing has kind of played a little bit in their own swim lane. So the data that marketing captures, they look at and then they use to send campaigns or segment audiences and so forth. I think the change, and we've done this internally at Salesforce in my team, um, and I'm starting to see many of our customers as well, is that the customer, the marketing team, sorry, is in the ability to bring together the whole view of the customer, not just the marketing campaigns that you're running to them, but what service cases have been raised by that customer potentially, or what sales have been made to that customer, or, you know, telemetry from a product if you have an IoT style device is coming in. And I think marketing's job, in my opinion now, is to bring that all together so you can create a single view of the customer. Because in this day and age, firstly, you don't want to be reaching out to a customer to sell them something if they've got an active service case with you. That's a, a terrible scenario. But as we move into the world of AI, where AI is going to be contacting the customer on behalf of marketing, if you don't have that view, if that means AI won't have that view, then your customer is probably going to get quite frustrated if they're not dealing with a human and the, the AI doesn't understand that they placed an order or they had a service issue. So I'm quite bullish on the fact that the best role to do this beyond maybe the CEO themselves, and they're clearly not going to drive it, they've got a lot to do themselves, is that the CMO is able to lead the charge here. Of course, you've got to work in partnership with IT and the CIO, maybe head of sales, um, head of customer service, but they've all got very different aspirations. And I don't see any of them wanting to care about the customer and put the customer at the center of everything they do in the way that I described there. Today, everyone is talking about AI, Leandro. In fact, a recent G2 survey revealed that AI integration into the MarTech is soaring with 75% of the businesses reporting AI adoption. Um, as the CMO of this region, what's on the top of your mind when it comes to emerging AI trends? Uh, and also a follow-up question on what sets organizations or business leaders apart who successfully implement AI interventions in marketing versus 
uh, business leaders who are not able to do it. Yeah, so like I mentioned before, AI has been around for some time and many marketers are using predictive AI. They may not know about it. So for example, in our marketing cloud, there's a feature called send time optimization. It's a feature that allows a marketer, you just switch it on and it works out when the best time to send an email message. If you're sending hundreds of thousands of messages, that's really important, right? You might send it at 10 a.m. for some individuals, at 1 p.m. for others, or after work at 6 or 7 or 8 p.m. for others. So they might be using it. They just don't know about it. Yes, there is a lot of um, discussion right now around predictive AI and the way to use that. To your question on who's having most success, I found, and, and I'll give you an example of what we've done in our organization, when it, it's in the flow of work, so it's not a separate tool, or it's not a use case that's looking for a business uh, sort of scenario. It's something that someone is already doing today, and you can inject AI into it to make it better, faster, more efficient, or deliver a better ROI. So to give you an example of that, what we did recently, and I mentioned that I ran the corporate messaging team before. Something that I implemented um, back then was that our CEO wanted to ensure that everyone, and we have over 70,000 employees, after Dreamforce, knew all the latest innovations we'd made and were able to talk in our newest narrative that we had just released. So how are we going to talk about Salesforce this year? So I set up a process which was called corporate certification. And basically, I, with my team, trained about 10 functional leaders on the latest messaging and then we went down in a train the trainer model, the organization. So those leaders had to train another 10, and then those 10 had to train another 10 to eventually we covered the 70,000 people. Now, as you can imagine, that's not a fast process because you know, you have all these people that have got to have a meeting, um, and then you're not quite sure of the quality of potentially by the time you get to the end of the assessment that's going on. But it was better than not doing anything at all. Fast forward to this year and my, my, my pre, my, um, the, the gentleman that's taken over my role actually has implemented AI into this use case. So uh, Einstein, as I mentioned before, is our AI capability. And we've actually got Einstein available to us in Slack. And uh, what we did is you would record yourself in Slack for five minutes pitching the corporate message after you read all the materials. And you would upload this video and you would send it to, to Einstein and you would ask Einstein to rate your corporate presentation. And Einstein would come back because it had been fed several prompts on what to look for, what were things to, to grade, you know, a successful, not successful or a fail. And Einstein would come back saying, Leandro, you've done a great job, you know, highlighting this customer story in relation to this new product feature. You forgot to mention a statistic uh, and maybe your tone was a little bit too direct. You'd probably should make it more friendly. And we did that, that something that used to take months in a matter of two weeks. And the whole company was able to do that at scale with a higher quality. And we actually knew if everyone had actually done it before. So accountability. So to my example before, find a use case that is something that is already um, needed and do it in the flow of work. So in the tools that people are already using so they can see the immediate value. They're the leaders that I'm seeing are having success with AI today. That's a very important message for marketers today that AI is not there to, uh, you know, bring additional processes and tasks to burden the professionals today. Rather, it should be integrated organically uh, in whatever they're already doing. And with the use, use of AI, what you're doing, I mean, you don't even think about it. It happens organically because AI has made it very effective, efficient, uh, and it's driving results. Uh, with the use of AI, we also face this concern of adding a human touch to interventions where AI is involved. So what do you have to say about balancing the innovative potential of AI and the need to maintain authentic brand voice as well as personalization? Yeah, look, it's extremely important, especially as marketers, we don't want to have a world where every brand sounds the same, right? Because you, you'll have very little differentiation if your brand sounds the same, you're selling the same products, uh, your experience is the same. So you always need to work out how you're going to differentiate yourself. So, and by the way, this is not unique to my thinking. Many of our customers are thinking like that. So I can give you a few examples. So uh, in Australia, there's a brand called Mecca. It's, uh, and for the folks in the US, it's like Sephora. It's a makeup brand. 
Um, and uh, it's a very fast growing brand here in Australia, but they've got amazing, beautiful in-person stores. But of course, with the rise of digital um, buying and especially during COVID, they wanted to make sure that their uh, online experience was just as adequate. And so they introduced a chatbot called Miss Mecca. Right. So Miss Mecca is your entry onto your online experience. And by the way, my daughter, who's 16, huge fan. Right. She's on Miss Mecca like every other day, looking at all the fancy products that they've got available. Um, so what Miss Mecca can do is they've trained the bot with new Gen AI capabilities powered by Salesforce to have the brand tone of Mecca. So they fed in lots of the material that they've created customer service transcripts of conversations that real humans have had to generate a tone for the Mecca brand. So now when the individual comes to the website and is interacting with that chat bot, um, and you almost want to call that an AI agent now, actually, because the old chat bot wasn't that smart, in this AI agent, it sounds like a representative from, Miss, uh, from Mecca. And so that's number one. Number two is, to your point, there's always an element of having the human in the loop. So like another brand, which is a bit more global, it's called Total Bay Resorts. It's actually a huge golf tournament. Um, I'm not sure if you've heard about that before, or based in Hawaii. They're a premium brand and uh, they want to have a concierge-like experience with all of their customers. And for them, they want to have that first point where someone can maybe resolve a case quite quickly. And I think in their case, they were able to like have half or 50% of the cases handled by this um, digital AI concierge, but then straight away to be able to escalate to a human and the human needs to be in the loop, right? And I think in the case of Turtle Bay, they wanted to make sure they could always see what the AI had recommended before it got sent back as well. So, um, you know, there's different approaches you can take depending on if you're a high volume brand or a more sort of bespoke concierge like brand, but both have the opportunity to um, increase the ability of the human to do more. So I didn't actually mention in the case of Mecca, they deflected 75% of their chats to uh, not go to a human, and which means that those humans now have more time to spend with their uh, customers. And on the case of Turtle Bay, they just wanted to make the reaction time faster and more curated. So I think this is an example of how it can be done. But as you can see in both examples, they've thought about it. It isn't just a let's introduce AI, let's use the, the cheapest, most public tool out there. It's, it's a considered measured approach because once you put that in place, if you make a mistake, uh, or you don't get that right, there are severe consequences. And we've seen some of that out in the public where some AI goes wrong because they haven't, the company hasn't thought through about how it should work. You've stressed on this point of human intervention and how humans are the gatekeepers or they keep the final check on AI interventions and how uh, uh, organizations need to be careful about uh, using AI as well. In this context, storytelling, uh, unique storytelling has acquired a strategic significance for organizations, specifically the marketing function. In today's world, what are the key elements of marketing storytelling and how can leaders use it to promote their brands or enhance customer experience? Yeah, well, look, you're touching on something that's very close to my heart. Stories, um, and I, I didn't mention this earlier, while I have an Australian accent and I'm based in Australia, I was actually born in Argentina and uh, all Latinos love talking. <laughs> so stories are at the heart of everything uh, in my heart to having a good conversation, good relationship, uh, and that might be personal with a customer. And, uh, you know, I'm in B2B and historically B2B marketers have been pretty poor in this domain, I would say. Their storytelling has been, here are all the features of this new product, which is not going to get anyone excited. And luckily, like I mentioned before, I was blessed to have worked with some of the greatest people here. It's like our co-founder and CEO, Mark Benioff. He's the master storyteller, right? So be able to witness that up front and learn from him and being able to run those Dreamforce keynotes. I think it's super important that uh, in this day and age, like I mentioned, when there is new technologies like AI, that you differentiate yourself. And a good story can absolutely do that. And the way we do that at Salesforce is by sharing examples of how our customers have success, which is one of our core values. So Trust is our number one value because, of course, without trust, you can't really do anything with cloud computing or have a great relationship with the customer. But number two is the success of our customers and customer success. So for us, we've done that by um, creating films of the stories that our customers share. We, of course, feature our customers in our events. 
Um, we love to have our customers speak, showcase their, their, their product in live demonstrations. We capture those stories. We, uh, we celebrate those stories. Um, and then more recently, we've gone from not just celebrating stories about the brands, but also about the individuals at those brands that are helping deliver that. And we call those people trailblazers. And so we've got a whole program around trailblazers. We give people hoodies um, that say trailblazer on them. Uh, once you've reached sort of a certain milestone of like your impact has been uh, you know, huge on the community, you may receive a golden hoodie, which we give away on a keynote stage. Um, and, you know, that's part of this community that we've got created where people are learning skills, giving back. Um, and also improving their careers. Uh, so, so hopefully I've answered the question there, but I could go in many directions. Uh, I think it's a really critical component of, of any marketing team and of any brand in general. It's interesting to know that you didn't call them custom, uh, customer case studies, you call them customer stories. Uh, that's an important point to note. And the fact that customers also partake in the storytelling of the brand, yes. these are not two separate entities as such. Uh, Leandro, you've gained considerable influence in the marketing space. You also organize the executive conversation series at the Salesforce. Uh, how can effectively turn? How can companies effectively turn employees into brand ambassadors, uh, especially in a remote setting? Yeah. So, um, what's fun about working at Salesforce is right now we've realized the pivot from, of course, we run a lot of amazing events and we bring people to our, you know, our offices, but we know the world has gone, you know, very digital. And sometimes you need to engage people in the channels that they're in, you know, whether that be LinkedIn uh, or other social platforms on YouTube. And so one large scale thing we've done, which is pretty fun, is that we've got an official brand ambassador. I know you mentioned me as one, but our official brand ambassador is Matthew McConaughey, which is amazing, right? And hopefully folks know who he is, a famous Hollywood movie star. And, um, and we've realized is that being able to leverage the power of an influencer like him in our brand campaigns, like I mentioned before, he's, he's got a really fun one right now where he's the cowboy, he's the sheriff in the wild, wild west. And he's kicking out the bad AI guys that are trying to steal your data, basically, because they're not uh, they're not necessarily being transparent with the retention policies of, of the way that when the data is fed into the LLMs. Um, so that's at the highest level. But you're right. The next level down is it's extremely important in this day and age that you have people within your organization that can share the story of your brand, the short story of your customers. And we've done that by having folks like myself and our regional leaders become um, you know, trusted advisors or thought leaders on various platforms. Um, but you, know, you, you can't fake that, right? That these people do need to have expertise in what they're talking about. And you, the, the, the only real shift is moving it from someone that might just be talking to a small number of customers one-to-one. -one. You're just now making and using the scale of the internet and social media to elevate that. Um, and I see that obviously in the consumer world. Um, but in the B2B world, that hasn't always happened. Uh, and so, you know, I always like to look to the, the consumer world for inspiration. And clearly, that's what's happening with micro-influencers and influencers on all the social plan of, uh, platforms to sell you everything from, uh, you know, water to sliced bread these days, almost, it seems like, on, uh, on TikTok and on all the other social channels. But in the B2B world, you can take some of those inspirations as well. And you're obviously not going to be trying to sell them every other day, but share your advice so that you can gain their respect and that they can understand your position. So hopefully they'll want to have a follow-up conversation with you or someone in your organization. Thank you, Leandro. Uh, before we move to the last question, I'd like to ask you, uh, something about utilization of MarTech tools that we have. So according to G2 data, we've seen an increased utilization of marketing technology across the globe, but there are certain challenges that linger, for instance, lack of skilled workforce to operate these marketing tools mm -hmm. or uh, you know the extended time to return on investment. How do you think organizations can resolve challenges like this? Yeah, no, it's a great question because marketers uh, and the marketing field has become more technical, lucky for me, uh, because I've come from that path, but most haven't, right? And so I've taken a few approaches even within my own team, which is that you need to bring in some people that might have that expertise, 
And so we've definitely hired people that understand how to use marketing cloud or data cloud or our Tableau analytics solution, right? Because they can help maybe set up some of these potentially. The other track is to ensure that everyone in your team is skilling up. So we do that for various means. We, are, we offer Trailhead, which is a free online learning platform for a lot of the Salesforce tools, well, actually all the Salesforce tools, but also some other um, business leadership topics. Um, so that's really important because you want people to be self-serve, right? You don't want a marketer that needs to go to an analyst or hopefully not IT to understand if their campaign's working or the ROI of something they're doing. That's that's no longer acceptable, in, in my opinion, in today's day and age. And so you need to ensure that they have the folks to help them internally, but then skilling up and then using. And then I push for in all my meetings to make sure that we're, we're talking the talk and leveraging these tools, right? So in any of my meetings where we're reviewing performance, we're bringing up a Tableau dashboard. I'm asking the individual to be driving the dashboard, showing me the insights, um, or bringing up our data cloud platform to show me the segments that they've built of where they're going to target and why they're going to target. I think that's really the best way. You know, you're exposing individuals because not to your point, not everyone can be hired, and maybe you may not be able to hire all those roles. So you need to make sure that you're continually reskilling your existing workforce because these are not skills that are steady they change all the time and they grow and so you need that skill set in your team to be resilient and agile and learning all the time and so i think starting with that mindset is actually helpful in multiple dimensions right you've brought about this important point about reskilling the workforce you have not just upskilling them uh, to learn more about the technology and how to leverage it fully because a lot of organizations might find it cool to have a lot of these softwares and not use them fully to their abilities uh, last question for you, what's your vision for the future of marketing and how do you see your role evolving in the coming years? Look, I, I touched on my role a little bit and where I see marketing going. I, I would hope that CMOs can always have a seat at the table, at the C-suite table. They don't in every organization. I want to acknowledge that and I think they should. Uh, I think AI presents an interesting opportunity because when an organization implements AI at scale, and most will in the next few years, customers will be talking potentially to AI, and then eventually customers will have their own AI. So AI will be talking to AI. And I think uh, the, the, the organization that is best equipped to understand the needs of the customer and to cut through, in my opinion, is the marketing department because of their ambition to drive growth, for their understanding of the requirements of the customer. And so I ask and I implore all marketers to ensure that this technology is not left for other departments and other teams. It's really marketers. We must take up this challenge. Um, so I think that's where I, I see uh, marketing going and the individuals. Uh, I do not see any um, reduction in CEOs asking for ROI for everything from software to the investment. So skilling up also on your analytics and your data analysis skills so that you can talk to a CFO and you can defend uh, where all of your money is going and the investments that you want to make. Um, and then I think you were, your last part, maybe remind me of the last part of the question because you had uh, where CMO and then personally, was that, was that the last bit? Yeah, personally, how do you see your role evolving in the future? Yeah, look, I think for me, I'm a, like I mentioned, I'm a little bit of a unique one. I've not come the traditional part in marketing. Um, I'm just really excited to be in a company like Salesforce that's growing. We have a lot of new products. I'm in a growth region. APAC is one of the fastest regions at Salesforce, so a growth region. Um, and I'm really excited just about technology and where it's all going. Um, so my hope is that I can continue to work with all of our amazing customers in the region. We're very privileged to have some amazing brands. And like you mentioned before, they give me the opportunity to interview them and uh, share stories. I'm just someone that's very curious also about business and having uh, organizations succeed. So I hope to be doing that for many, many more years. Thank you, Leandro. That wraps up our conversation with Leandro, who is the CMO and Senior Vice President at Salesforce for the Asia Pacific region. If you're interested in getting more such insights from industry leaders, you can check out our blog at learn.g2.com slash tag slash industry dash insights. Thank you once again, Leandro. We hope you had a good time. Thank you very much. I really enjoyed the chat. Thank you.